Thank you. And that concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions. And we start with question number one from Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I ask the First Minister whether, with hindsight, she now accepts that holding private meetings with her predecessor... Whether she now accepts that holding private meetings with her predecessor to discuss allegations facing him was a mistake? And if so, when did she reach that conclusion after the first, second, third, fourth or fifth time they met to discuss them? First Minister. Well, can I say, uh, this is Jackson Carlow, questions uh, have been raised about these matters. I think questions have legitimately been raised. Um, I've set out uh, an account of the decisions I took. Um, but beyond that, I now intend uh, fully, as First Minister, to respect uh, the work of the various investigations that have now been established. Uh, Jackson Carlow, last week at First Minister's Questions, asked me to support a parliamentary inquiry into these matters. I have done so, uh, and the Parliamentary Bureau discussed this issue earlier this week. Uh, last week, Richard Leonard asked me to make a referral uh, of my own uh, conduct to the advisors on the ministerial code. I have done that. Uh, in addition, the Scottish Government uh, will establish a review. I, I can tell the Chamber today that will be externally led. I will have no role in that, any role I would have performed in the establishment of that. I've asked the Deputy First Minister uh, to perform instead. And of course, there is an ongoing police inquiry. So let me say to Jackson Carlow and to the Chamber, I will answer any question uh, to the fullest extent possible and my government will cooperate fully with all and any inquiries. But I think other members in the Chamber now need to recognise that having asked for these investigations, they are also now obliged to respect those investigations. Jackson Carlow. She can't hide behind an inquiry and likely, and likely forthcoming police inquiry without answering the obvious questions, who knew what, when and how. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Nicola Sturgeon in 2007, when as Deputy First Minister, she was demanding answers of Wendy Alexander over donations to the Labour Party. So by De Nicola Sturgeon's own definition then, we do have both the right and the responsibility to ask questions now. First Minister, we also have the right to answers too. Now, since we last discussed this at First Minister's Questions, we've learned that there were other contacts beyond those the First Minister revealed to Parliament last week. We've learned that her Chief of Staff met a former aide of Mr Salmon's not once, but twice prior to the first meeting on April the 2nd. And it's been reported at one of those meetings, the First Minister's Chief of Staff, to quote Mr Salmon's team, tipped them off. She said she suspected an investigation was underway. Two inquiries will get to the bottom of all of this, but surely the First Minister does not need an inquiry to realise that if that is indeed what happened, it was just plain wrong. First Minister. If Jackson Carlow takes the view now that respecting inquiries that have been established constitutes hiding behind them, then it begs the question, why did Jackson Carlow ask for such an inquiry to be set up last week? Uh, that was his challenge to me last week, uh, support a parliamentary inquiry. I have done that. The uh, challenge from the other side of the chamber was to refer myself to the advisers on the ministerial code. I have done that as well. Uh, there will be a government review of the process. And of course, there is an ongoing police inquiry. Uh, I have set out an account of the decisions uh, I took. I've uh, also uh, corrected uh, inaccurate claims that have appeared in the media. Beyond that, it is time to respect those inquiries. The inquiries that opposition members have called for uh, and the inquiries that I and my government have supported. I think that is the right thing to do. Uh, the inquiries I've spoken about, as well as the course of the uh, the work of the Information Commissioner, which the Scottish Government is fully cooperating with, I think it is fair to say that the decision-making processes involved in this matter uh, may turn out to be the most scrutinised of any decision-making uh, processes in the lifetime of this Parliament. And that is right and proper. 
But it strikes me you can't call for inquiries uh, and then uh, refuse to respect the work of those inquiries. I will respect the work of those inquiries. The question is, will others across the chamber? Jackson Carlo. As I pointed out, First Minister, that's precisely what you did. And the problem is you seem quite happy for advisers to you to be briefing the media on these questions as they're arising, but reluctant to actually answer them here in Parliament. And the problem here is that we have two completely contradictory versions of events. In Mr Salmon's version, the First Minister's team knew about the complaint before the 2nd of April. In the First Minister's version, she and her team were completely in the dark until they all met at her house on that date. Now, both simply cannot be right. So will the First Minister put it on the record today, and this is something that I think needs to be clarified now, that contrary to what is being alleged, neither her Chief of Staff nor indeed any other government special advisor had any knowledge of a complaint before the 2nd of April? First Minister. I have already set out uh, the account uh, of when I first became uh, aware. We've corrected inaccurate claims in the media this week uh, relating to my Chief of Staff. That has all been done. Uh, the issue now, uh, Jason Carlaw said, and uh, perhaps this is a point I can uh, go some way to agreeing with him on, that there are differing uh, accounts of this. That is why it is important now to allow the scrutiny of the inquiries that have been established. So having called for those inquiries, uh, having got the agreement of myself, my government, my party, uh, to support the establishment of those inquiries and to cooperate fully with them, I think it is incumbent on all of us now uh, to respect those processes. That's what I'm going to do. I think the question for Jackson Carlaw, is he really interested uh, in getting to the heart of these matters or does he simply want to continue to make party political points over them? Jackson Carlaw. I'm interested in asking questions about the matters that have arisen since I last questioned the First Minister last week. And clearly I'm concerned that her advisers are briefing the media in response to inquiries of this nature, but she seems reluctant to respond to inquiries here in the Chamber. And if nothing else, this has shown why the parliamentary inqu inquiry, which we did request, is necessary, and why we must all hope that it can begin as soon as possible, because numerous questions beyond those I've asked today are outstanding. What did the First Minister and Mr Salmon discuss? What did the First Minister continue to meet the former First Minister as late as July last year, despite subsequently telling us she couldn't get involved? And did the Permanent Secretary approve of that final meeting in advance, or was she only informed of it afterwards? And all of us are asking, all of us are asking, what on earth did you think you were doing? The First Minister will have to answer these questions sooner or later. So for the avoidance of doubt, will the First Minister confirm today that she will make herself available personally to appear before the parliamentary inquiry, not just, as, not just as she did in her answer to me last week, say that she would, be supply, she would prepare to supply information to it, but that she will be prepared to appear personally before that inquiry. And doesn't she accept that this tawdry business and her handling of it in the last seven days has fundamentally undermined trust in her government. First Minister. Firstly, just uh, let me, I, I think I, I heard Jackson Carlow uh, correctly when he asked, am I prepared to personally appear before an inquiry? Uh, yes, I am. And as First Minister, I don't consider it optional for me uh, as to whether or not I appear before uh, parliamentary committees. That is a part of my job and a part of my responsibility. I can't believe that Jackson Carlaw would have doubted that for a single second. Uh, the questions Jackson Carlaw has posed today, I understand why he's posing them, but these are exactly the questions that these various inquiries uh, will now look at. And I simply say to him again, it is incumbent on all of us to respect those inquiries. And I think perhaps more than anything right now, uh, given uh, that at the heart of this whole issue, are women who brought forward complaints. It's incumbent on all of us to respect the ongoing police inquiry into this. And I would uh, call on everybody to do that. Uh, Jackson Carlow uh, said uh, he, he wanted to ask me what on earth I thought uh, I was uh, doing. Uh, I think I know what Jackson Carlow uh, is doing yeah. today yeah. in raising this issue, notwithstanding the fact that I've opened myself to complete scrutiny on all of these issues. I think Jackson Carlaw is trying to avoid uh, talking about the mess of the Brexit <laughs> negotiations that his party is making. He talked, he talked about a 
tawdry affair, the tawdry thing happening in Scotland right now is that we are being taken out of the European Union against our will by the Tory government. Our country faces untold damage because of the chaos and mess that his party is presiding over. What on earth do the Tories think they're doing? That is the tawdry business and that's what people in Scotland want to hear answers about. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, the establishment this week of a special committee of inquiry into the government's handling of serious allegations, serious allegations made against Alex Salmond, is an unprecedented step, but a necessary one. It's the right thing to do to rebuild trust and confidence in a system that has been badly dented. But what also counts is how we conduct ourselves, MSPs, Parliament and Government. So is the First Minister willing to accept her Government has not conducted itself in a fit and proper way this week by using vocabulary like vendetta and smear in connection with this case? First Minister. Well, I have uh, corrected inaccurate claims uh, that were made, and I, I think that is important. Uh, I, as I said last week, I believe I uh, and I believe my government have acted appropriately in this matter. But as I said at the weekend, when I took the decision to refer myself to the independent advisers, uh, I do also believe it is important uh, to convince the parliament and the wider public of that and I uh, therefore agree uh, with Richard Leonard about the reason for the importance uh, not just of the parliamentary inquiry but of the decision I took as well so uh, that is the process or these are the processes that I think are now necessary and I hope Richard Leonard will agree with me in the point I've been making to Jackson Carlaw that it's also important for all of us now to respect uh, the work and the decisions that those inquiries take. Richard Leonard. Uh, President, officer, we all understand that this is very difficult for the, for the First Minister's party, but that cannot be allowed to overshadow the very serious question of how the First Minister's government has handled these grave allegations. The First Minister told me last week that if there is a parliamentary inquiry, we will, of course, make all appropriate information available. Can she confirm today that all appropriate information includes not only all internal government correspondence, but also all internal SNP correspondence. First Minister. The inquiries will be able to request whatever material they want, and I undertake today that we will provide whatever material uh, the inquiries request. That is the meaning of full, thorough, open inquiries. It will not be for me to decide uh, what material the parliamentary inquiry, uh, when it gets underway, uh, wants to request. Uh, my commitment is that the uh, government, I, uh, will cooperate fully uh, with that, and I think uh, that is uh, appropriate. Uh, Richard Leonard talks about difficulties. None of that has got in the way of uh, me, the government, uh, my party doing the right thing this week in agreeing to and supporting uh, the establishment of a parliamentary inquiry. It hasn't got in the way of me doing what I consider to be the right thing in the referral to uh, the advisers on the ministerial code. Uh, but also, and I, I do think actually this is a point Richard Leonard has made and it's a point I agree with, uh, at the heart of this, and it's, it's the part that uh, is more important, it's the part which uh, leads me uh, mostly to regret the error in the government's process that was made. At the heart of this are women who brought forward complaints and it's important uh, that we re respect the processes in terms of the investigation of those complaints and that means all of us respecting the fact that as well as the inquiries we've been talking about today there is also an ongoing police inquiry and I hope all of us uh, will respect that and how we conduct ourselves over the time to come. Richard Leonard. Uh, the First Minister is right. Uh, we should not forget that two women have been badly failed by the system and they are entitled to answers, which is why the parliamentary inquiry must be as thorough as possible. And that means applying and following the seven Nolan principles of public life, openness, honesty, leadership, selflessness, accountability, integrity, and objectivity. So the committee must meet in public. There should be no limit on how long it sits for and how many sittings it has. And I hope the First Minister will agree to that when she replies. But there is a further issue, presiding officer. 
according to parliamentary precedent, the position of committee chair is due to be offered to the SNP. But this is an unprecedented situation. This inquiry is about restoring trust and confidence. So will the First Minister's party do the right thing? Will they step aside and ensure that an MSP from another party chairs this inquiry? First Minister. I think, I think Richard Leonard, uh, with respect, misunderstands my role in the establishment of this inquiry. It is not me that is establishing the inquiry. It is not me that is deciding uh, who conducts the inquiry when it sits, how long it sits, what its remit is, who chairs it, who is on the inquiry. These are decisions for the Parliamentary Bureau. And what I am making very clear is I will respect whatever decisions the Parliamentary Bureau uh, makes around that. There would be something deeply wrong if having supported an inquiry into these matters, I then started to try to dictate, even if it was uh, in responding to questions from Richard Leonard, I started to dictate the terms on which that inquiry was to be conducted. These are matters for Parliament, and the commitment I give Parliament is that I and my government uh, will cooperate fully uh, whatever the terms Parliament decides on. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Mark MacDonald. Stonywood Mill in my constituency has been producing paper for 250 years and employs nearly 500 people. This week the business was placed into administration after a takeover deal collapsed. These are clearly worrying times for the workforce and their families. I've spoken with the company and with union representatives and will continue that dialogue this week. The resolve to secure the future of the business is strong and is shared by all. The Scottish Government have indicated that they and their agencies stand ready to support the business. Can I ask the First Minister if a task force will be established, as it has been in other areas, bringing together agencies and stakeholders to look at how best to support the business and help generate investment, find a new buyer, safeguard highly skilled jobs and secure a positive future for a vital employer in Aberdeen? First Minister. Well, can I thank Mark McDonald for raising uh, this important issue. I was also very concerned to learn of the situation with Argel Wiggins, uh, which is based in Aberdeen. Uh, I can tell the Chamber that the Minister for Business has already spoken directly with the Managing Director of the company and the General Manager of the Stonywood Mill and communicated our full support. He also spoke to uh, Unite Union this morning. Uh, our focus at this stage is on supporting the business to find a new buyer and on doing all we can to try to minimise the impact on the workforce. Scottish Enterprise have been in contact with the management uh, to support uh, the company in its plans to try to secure a new buyer. In response to the specific question about a task force, uh, we look at whether uh, that kind of approach is appropriate in all of these circumstances. I will ask the uh, Minister for Business to consider that specifically um, and to correspond uh, or to discuss directly with Mark Macdonald how best to bring all of the, the key uh, individuals and organisations together here to make sure that we have the best possible response. Bob Doris to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Bob Doris. First Minister, uh, BBC Social highlighted the practice of gaming by a so-called male pickup act artist in Glasgow, including footage on Maryhill Road. Whilst I would make no further comment of that specific matter, given it is now subject to a police investigation, does the First Minister agree with me that this would be a timely opportunity to encourage the public to participate in the Scottish Government's hate crime consultation, uh, which is currently seeking, amongst other things, the public's views on recommendations around potential changes to the law on gender hostility and the stirring up of hatred. First Minister. Well, can I thank Bob Doris for raising this issue? I'm sure everybody in the chamber uh, would, like me, have been shocked uh, and appalled by the BBC's investigation into so-called gaming. I uh, watched the BBC social film and can say I was uh, utterly sickened uh, by what I saw. It did indeed, though, as Bob Doris uh, says, highlight why there is such a clear need for action to be taken to tackle gender-based prejudice and indeed gender-based violence. Lord Brackadale's view in his report on hate crime was that there are patterns of offending which relate particularly to hatred based on prejudice towards the victim's gender and which should be addressed through reformed hate crime legislation. Uh, the current consultation seeks views on how best to tackle misogyny and gender-based prejudice in Scotland and I would certainly encourage everyone who has an interest in this area, uh, which should be all of us, uh, to make their views known through the consultation process which runs until the 24th of February. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Jamie Green. 
Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the plight of young people who attended the new school Butterstone, who were forced out of their specialist boarding school two months ago and have been completely out of the education system uh, in the eight weeks since. What message can she give to the families that are now faced with alternative options which fall way short of what the new school was providing? And how can councils be better resourced to ensure there's enough specialist and mainstream provision for pupils with extreme special needs? Well, can I thank Matt Ruskell for raising the issue? Uh, as uh, I know he and others are aware, uh, the decision to close the school was one uh, taken by the board of the school. It is a a sad event and I have no doubt about the impact that this will have on the whole community but especially on uh, young people who attended uh, the school. Uh, since the board made its decision all seven local authorities have been working closely with families to identify the appropriate care and support for young people who attended the school. Every family has been offered support and education by the local authority and for most of the young people alternative places or interim provision have now been agreed. Uh, of course, uh, the work recognises that challenging individual circumstances of each child or young person have to be taken into account, and that's why local authorities are working closely with uh, families involved. Uh, the Deputy First Minister met with parents and staff uh, in November last year and listened to the concerns they have, and he will continue to receive regular updates on progress, and I'm sure we'd we'll be happy to uh, liaise and discuss again uh, with parents and staff if that would be considered helpful. Jamie Green to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been contacted by the concerned family of a 90-year-old lady who lives alone on the Isle of Arran. They've asked that I don't name her publicly in the chamber today, but I'm happy to provide details in private. Uh, she suffers from macular degeneration, memory loss and mobility issues. Her family requested social care at home, and it was told that this is not possible due to staff shortages on the island, despite having been assessed as requiring it several times a day. First Minister, uh, are you confident that this is an example of a government uh, that is delivering its flagship policy of free personal care to people in Scotland. And First Sorry. Minister, whatever happened to the commitment to island-proof access to public services? First Minister. What? As I hope Jamie Green will appreciate, I don't know the details of this individual case. It certainly uh, raises concerns uh, in my mind, and uh, I know with the, the Health Secretary as well, I completely understand why he uh, hasn't uh, named the individual, but if he wants to pass, as he indicated he would, the details to me and to Jean Freeman, I can give an undertaking that we will look into that as quickly as possible uh, and then reply uh, to him. Uh, I don't uh, want to assume that that uh, suggests there are wider issues here, but if there are any wider issues that this uh, case suggests, Adam, please, here that is something that uh, the health secretary will discuss with the local health board and the local authority so we're very happy to look into this and take whatever action is considered necessary and neil bibby at a time when council budgets are under pressure and teachers are raising concern about workload smp-led renfrewshire council will this afternoon consider increasing primaries to class sizes from 25 to 30. Is this not another example of the impact Scottish Government cuts are having on local communities, including in the Finance Secretary's own backyard? And what does this say about the First Minister's statements, both that local councils are getting a fair funding deal and that education is her number one priority? Yeah. First Minister. Well, of course, in the draft, in the draft uh, budget, we offer uh, to local government a real terms increase in the funding uh, they have for day-to-day uh, -day services like education. We also have seen in uh, the last couple of years a rise in the number of teachers working in our schools. Uh, obviously, we will have uh, discussions and votes in this chamber on the budget over the next few weeks. And I repeat the offer that I've previously made to Richard Leonard uh, to Neil Bibby. Uh, if Neil Bibby's view is that the government should be making additional resources available to local government, then we are very happy to listen to suggestions from Labour about where those resources should come from. There are no unallocated resources in the draft budget, but we remain happy to discuss with other parties. Uh, and if Labour ever get round to bringing forward any constructive suggestions, uh, we will be happy to engage with those. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Presiding officer, to listen to the opening questions from Labour and the Conservatives, we'd be forgiven for thinking that the country wasn't facing the biggest political crisis for generations. <laughs> and perhaps that tells us something about why a parliament dominated by those two parties has brought us to a situation Absolutely. in which the word omni-shambles sounds like timid understatement. I recognise the First Minister's position that extending or revoking Article 50 are necessary and that a people's vote is necessary. These options clearly must be taken. And both May's deal 
and no deal have clearly been rejected. The UK government must be under pressure to accept this. But the First Minister has also said for a long time that the case for Scottish independence depends on a material change of circumstances. Given the level of chaos, there is no single aspect of these circumstances which hasn't changed beyond recognition since, 19, since 2016. The First Minister has spoken to the Prime Minister this week. Can she confirm, did she explicitly raise independence during that discussion and make the case for Scotland's right to decide about our own future in that conversation with the Prime Minister? First Minister. I think the Prime Minister is very well aware of my views on independence. I support independence and I think the sooner Scotland is independent, the better for all of us. <laughs> on, the, on the issue of... Of, of Brexit, I think Patrick Harvey is absolutely right. The Prime Minister right now uh, is in the process of driving the whole of the UK off of a cliff edge. Uh, but right now, Jeremy Corbyn is sitting in the passenger seat of that car, taking the UK off that cliff edge. Uh, it is disgraceful the way in which both the government at Westminster and the official opposition uh, have failed to stop uh, this catastrophe developing. Um, obviously, there's some water to go under the Brexit bridge over the next few weeks. But let me uh, be very clear about this, as Patrick Harvey has said. I think the case for independence uh, and support for independence grows with every day that passes. And I think it is essential, uh, given the catastrophe that Scotland faces to our economy, to our society, to living standards, to prospects for the next generation, uh, to our reputation in the world, that that option of independence must be open to people in Scotland. And when people in Scotland have the ability to choose independence, I believe the country will opt to be an independent country. Patrick Harvey. It is indeed extraordinary that two and a half years since the EU referendum, there is no more clarity within the, the mind of the UK government about the future than there was at the start of this process. And with just 10 weeks to go until the UK government's self-imposed Brexit deadline, for which they are completely unprepared, surely nobody except the disaster capitalists of the, the Brexit extremists can think that the time can be simply allowed to tick away. So at the very least, extension of the process is surely inevitable now. Yesterday, the First Minister said she will have more to say about the timing of an independence vote in the coming weeks. In the face of this incompetent misrule from Westminster, that clarity is absolutely needed. Can the First Minister confirm that that timing of information in the next few weeks will be the case even if Article 50 is extended? First Minister. Yes. I, 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 will, uh, expand. I will expand on that because I, I enjoy uh, talking about these things. Patrick Harvey is, is absolutely right when he says extension of Article 50 is essential now. Uh, Theresa May has wasted time. Uh, it seems to me her tactic has been to uh, run down the clock to try to hope she can panic people into backing her deal, the one that was rejected in a historic defeat in the House of Commons uh, this week. And it seems to me that Jeremy Corbyn is quite uh, happy to almost collude with her in doing that. That cannot be allowed to happen. Uh, Article 50 should be extended and I think that across the UK the issue of EU membership uh, should go back to the electorate. But of course uh, it could be that the extension of Article 50 is simply a reprieve from Brexit and not a solution uh, for uh, Brexit. So uh, yes there is water to go under the bridge in the next matter of weeks uh, and when it is done so I will make my views uh, on the timing of a choice on independence clear. And it, it is then of course for all of us who support independence and that certainly includes me and it includes Patrick Harvey, uh, to get out there and make the case. Uh, because I believe that that case has been strengthened uh, by what has happened in the last uh, two and a half years. And if we get out and make that case, then people in Scotland uh, will choose to be an independent country and we can get on with building a better future than the one offered to us by the chaos and incompetence of Westminster. A further couple of supplementaries. The first, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. We know that Theresa May's proposed deal is finished. A confidence vote to force a general election has failed and a no-deal Brexit is unthinkable. For any progress to be made to the end or end this Brexit stalemate, does the First Minister agree that we need a second EU referendum and call on Labour 
to join us in that demand. First Minister. Uh, well, it is time for Jeremy Corbyn and Labour to get off the fence that they have been sitting on for so long on this. Uh, Labour's position was that they wanted to try uh, and have a general election first, to force a general election. Uh, there was the uh, debate and vote of no confidence in the government yesterday. SNP MPs uh, voted to have no confidence in the government. We backed Labour in that attempt, but that did not pass. Uh, there is not going to be a general election right uh, now. And therefore, the time is right and the time is urgent and pressing for Jeremy Corbyn to say whether or not he backs a second EU referendum. And I call on him today to do so without further delay, because the longer he prevaricates, uh, the more he becomes just as responsible as the Tories uh, for the disaster that the UK is now facing. And as Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cancer touches us all. So as the co-convener of the cross-party group on cancer, today I am pleased to be part of publishing the report into the implementation of the Scottish Government's cancer strategy. This was led by experts, professionals, charities and campaigners. This report re supports the ambition of the Government's strategy, recognises where progress has been made, but also highlights areas of concern which will ultimately mean that the strategy won't be implemented in full by the end of the Parliament as promised. Does the First Minister recognise the impact of workforce planning issues and high vacancy rates in undermining the ability to diagnose early, to treat quickly and therefore improve survival rates? First Minister. Well, can I uh, firstly say that I very much welcome the implementation report that's been published by the Cross-Party Group on Cancer. Um, I think it uh, says that real progress has been made. I mean, the report, as Anna Sarwar has said, marks the halfway point in the strategy's five-year lifetime, and it finds that uh, 47 out of 54 of the strategy's actions and investments have been completed or are on track. Uh, it does raise concerns around uh, staffing, uh, and we recognise there are challenges in recruiting uh, the right specialist staff for some services, which is why the Scottish Cancer Task Force is already feeding into the development of our integrated workforce plan, which of course aims to address workforce needs right across Scotland. I would simply say in passing uh, that of course uh, the challenges uh, of staffing are going to be exacerbated by the prospect of Brexit, and I think that's some something all of us should keep in mind. Uh, I know the Health Secretary met with the Cancer Coalition I think, earlier today uh, to discuss uh, how we continue to drive forward the strategy, but the implementation report that's been published by the Cross-Party Group will be a helpful uh, contribution to making sure that we do exactly that. Gordon MacDonald. The UK Government this week announced using Brexit as a smokescreen that pensioners living with a younger partner would be forced to move to universal credit rather than pension credit, costing couples up to £7,000 a year. Does the First Minister agree that this shameful approach to our pensioners should be ditched immediately and will she join me in once again demanding a halt to universal credit? First Minister. Well, it's interesting whenever universal credit is raised to look across and see how many Conservative members are studiously looking at their phones uh, rather than engaging uh, in the, the discussion. Uh, this decision uh, is absolutely shameful. Uh, basically, it says to uh, pensioners that in future, uh, if one pensioner's partner is under pensionable age, uh, then they will require to apply for universal credit. Now, you know, that may not sound... Uh, a particularly big thing until you consider that that will cost some of the poorest pensioners uh, in the country up to £7,000 a year. It is absolutely disgraceful and yet another reason why universal credit should be halted in its tracks. So I repeat again today the call I have made many times for the UK government to do just that but I also repeat the call that I've made many times in the past for responsibility for these matters to come to the Scottish Parliament so that we can take our own decisions and not be at the mercy of the decisions taken uh, by an uncaring, unfeeling Conservative government. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Minister, what progress has been made in reaching a deal over teacher pay? First Minister. 
Uh, negotiations are ongoing and progress is being made. Uh, the Scottish Government has made an enhanced proposal to the EIS and has asked COSLA to also agree this. Uh, that proposal would mean that all teachers would receive a minimum 9% increase between January 2018 and April 2019, with a further 3% in April 2020. Uh, that's a clear indication of our commitment to recruit and retain teachers, and it is the best offer in the public sector anywhere in the UK. Uh, I urge COSLA to adopt this proposal as a formal offer, a necessary step to resolving the dispute, and and if it does so, I also urge the teaching unions to consider this favourably so that we can bring discussions to a positive conclusion. Claire Adamson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Can I ask her to confirm that the funding for the pay increase will come from government in addition to the enhanced local government settlement for the coming year? And can also ask what timescales going ahead are for finding agreement with all parties involved in the process? First question. Well, firstly, yes, I can confirm that any additional budget allocation uh, to fund a negotiated agreement will be met by the Scottish Government and that this will be in addition to the enhanced local government settlement for the coming year. It will not come from uh, the education budget. Uh, on timing, uh, teachers' pay negotiations, of course, are a matter for the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers. Uh, however, the next SNCT pay meeting is scheduled for the 28th of January, where we hope that all parties can reach agreement on an offer that can be put to the teacher union's membership, hopefully for ratification. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Why does the First Minister believe that teachers are contemplating strike action? First Minister. Uh, teachers uh, want to see uh, a good pay rise. I believe they're being offered a good pay rise. I believe they were being offered uh, a good pay rise, but the enhanced offer uh, underlines that fact. I would stress this point uh, again. If uh, this enhanced offer made by the Scottish Government is uh, firstly agreed to by COSLA and then agreed to uh, by teachers, it will mean that uh, in April this year, uh, teachers' salaries will increase by 9% uh, compared to what a teacher will get in their pay packet this month. That would be the best pay rise for any public sector worker anywhere in the UK. So I think it's a good offer and I really hope we can, over the next few weeks, get to a point uh, where it is accepted. It's fair uh, to teachers. Uh, it's also uh, affordable and that's a, a key consideration for the government. Uh, and it means we will resolve a dispute uh, over pay and that absolutely is in the interest of young people across the country. Question number five, Miles Briggs. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a letter signed by all stroke clinicians in Scotland calling for urgent introduction of a thrombectomy service. First Minister. Thrombectomy for stroke is a relatively new clinical intervention. We recognise that it can significantly improve outcomes and quality of life for people who've suffered uh, an ischemic stroke. Uh, that's why the Directors of Planning Thrombectomy Advisory Group have produced a national planning framework for the provision uh, of this intervention for Scotland. The framework will be presented to the National Planning Board at their January meeting and will then provide the basis for the implementation and spread of thrombectomy provision in Scotland. Miles Briggs. I raised this issue with the First Minister in September and I know she's aware that the NHS England's long-term NHS plan makes a commitment to invest further in thrombectomy services in England and that's expected to not only improve care but also to deliver in long-term care cost reductions. As it stands, Scotland has no thrombectomy service whatsoever, NHS Lothian having withdrawn that service last year. So can I ask the First Minister, will she guarantee today that stroke patients in Scotland will be able to receive a thrombectomy this year? First Minister. Uh, well, what we are working towards is the provision uh, of a service and of course, uh, as I understand it, uh, similar work will be underway uh, in, in England. This is a relatively new clinical intervention, so it's important uh, to ensure that services are safe and that they deliver high quality to patients, that the, the proper work and planning is undertaking. As I said in my initial answer, the advisory group have produced a national planning framework that will provide the basis for developing a service in Scotland and that framework will be presented to the National Planning Board this month and at that point we'll be able to take decisions about how we are then going to roll that out and that is something that the Health Secretary will keep the Chamber fully updated on. And Monica Lennon. Can the First Minister confirm whether the commitment to thrombectomy in NHS England's long-term plan comes with equivalent Barnet consequentials and by how much? And will she guarantee that any such consequentials will be invested in supporting the further development of thrombectomy to make sure we don't fall behind the rest of the UK and Europe? First Minister. 
Uh, well, I, I will get back to the member on whether there is a specific uh, provision in consequentials uh, flowing from the decision in England. I would suspect not. I think that decision came after uh, the budget decisions. Also, often these consequentials are rolled up uh, and are not specific in terms of what particular uh, lines they flow from. But that aside, uh, we are, as I've set out, uh, we are uh, determined to see a service rolled out in Scotland, but it's absolutely vital uh, that that's done on the basis of proper uh, clinical uh, planning and that's why the process that I outlined in response to the previous question is so important. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, decisions will be uh, able to be taken uh, after the Na National Planning Board this month and Jean Freeman will keep members who have an interest in this fully updated. Question number six, Alex Rowley. To ask the First Minister what impact reduction to local government budgets could have on the national performance framework. First Minister. Well, despite a reduction uh, to the Scottish Government budget as a result of UK Government austerity, we have maintained the overall funding for local government as a share of overall spending at around 27%. We have also provided a real terms increase in both the revenue and capital support we provide to them in our most recent budget. Uh, the National Performance Framework sets out a clear purpose to create a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish. Uh, and providing local government with a real terms funding increase reaffirms our commitment to a strong partnership with local government and will allow us to meet our shared ambitions uh, for the people and the communities that we serve. Alex Rowley. That's good and well, but the reality for the majority of people is real cuts to local services and communities up and down Scotland, and five millions of pounds being cut from frontline school budgets. In Clackmannanshire, a council on the brink of collapse. In Edinburgh, a bins lying uncollected because of cuts. In the Highlands and in the Borders, closing public toilets, closing leisure facilities. Right across Scotland, libraries, music lessons, swimming pools, education, social care, cuts, cuts, cuts. When is the First Minister going to wake up to the reality of, yes, failed Tory austerity, but also the failure of her government when it comes to protecting vital public services? Will she agree to personally meet with council leaders and hear firsthand the desperate situation councils are in as a direct result of successive SNP budgets? First Minister. As I'm sure our Alec Rowley uh, would recognise, the Scottish Government's budget over this decade is being cut in real terms. That creates a significant problem for the Scottish Government. Notwithstanding that, the draft budget that Derek Mackay put forward before uh, the end of the year uh, offers a real terms increase uh, to local government. Uh, we don't suggest uh, that that makes life easy. But I come back to the point uh, that I've made several times in this chamber. We have allocated every penny available to us in that budget. We've given £700 million, more than £700 million extra uh, to health services, a real terms increase for local government. If Labour want to propose alterations to that budget, it is not enough to say where they want to spend more money, they have to also set out their suggestions from where that money comes from. Labour, Labour thus far, unless, unless the Finance Secretary is going to tell me he's had something very recently, Labour haven't yet made any budget proposals to the Scottish Government. So Alec Rowley, Alec Rowley asked me about personally meeting people. If Labour want to come forward with suggestions uh, for, how, for where we take money in the Scottish budget to give more money to local government. I'll personally meet with Richard Leonard and anybody else, but I'm still waiting on these proposals. Maybe they'll come this afternoon. Maybe they'll come next week. Let's wait and see. John Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that in South Ayrshire there's a £17.1 million budget shortfall. With regard to social care performance indicators, the First Minister should also be aware that around 60 hospital patients are awaiting discharge from hospital because South Ayrshire Council is unable to provide packages of care for these patients as there is no funding. Will the Scottish Government consider further support to South Ayrshire Council to deal specifically with this problem? First Minister. Well, you know, these are really important issues uh, that John Scott is raising, but the lack of self-awareness of Tory MPs is quite staggering. 
You know, he talks about shortage of resources. Can I just remind uh, the member that the Scottish Government's budget is being reduced in real terms by decisions taken by his party uh, at Westminster over uh, this period. Can I also gently remind the member that if we were to follow uh, the budget proposals put forward by his party in this chamber to give tax cuts to the highest earners in Scotland, we would be faced with taking an additional £550 million out of budgets for schools and hospitals and other public services. The Tories really have no shame at all. Cutting our budget, calling for tax cuts that would cut our budget even further and yet calling for more money. You know, maybe when the Tories get their own sums to add up, they'll be taken seriously when they ask questions like that in this chamber. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. And we're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Edward Mountain on fairer hospital TV charges. But we're just going to have a short suspension while the public gallery has time to change and ministers and members to move seats. A short suspension. <laughs>